Welcome, what we say good morning to our Cavs reporter Dave McMenamin, live from the queue with us on Sports Center. Dave, the series obviously going back your way now. How have the first two games, though, in this series changed the way the Cavs perceive the Warriors? Well, Randy, there's all this talk about the trilogy and how they have this history with the Warriors, so they should be familiar with them. But after game two in particular, after a, another stellar game out of Kevin Durant, the talk coming out of the Cavs locker room was, this is a different team. Uh, yeah, of course, they still have Clay and Steph and Draymond, and they're still wearing those old school city uniforms everyone likes. But uh, KD adds so much to this team. Now, he's scored uh, 71 points already in this series, more points than Harrison Barnes scored the entire seven game series last year. Kevin Durant's getting those same shots that Barnes got last year, only he's way more efficient at making them. Uh, I had one Cavs source tell me that we got to play close to perfect basketball to beat the Warriors. Maybe we can get away with 97% perfect basketball on the road, 85% perfect basketball at home. Uh, they feel with Kevin Durant, uh, they had to play at a consistently high level that, quite frankly, we haven't seen out of the Cavs the entire year. Well, Dave, that's certainly one way to break this series down, but the series could also be analyzed in a couple different ways, and you found one that's pretty simplistic. What, what is that? <laughs> yeah, pretty simple answer here. What's <laughs> going on between the Cavs and the Warriors? Warriors have two former MVPs in Steph Curry and Kevin Durant, and the Cavs have one in LeBron James. Now, LeBron in the past has propped up Kyrie Irving as a future MVP candidate. And Kyrie Irving looked like that type of guy in the Eastern Conference Finals in particular, shooting over 62% from the field, um, averaging over seven assists and, and around 26 points per game. He was stellar. He has not been that guy in the finals thus far. And if you're playing you know, a, a game of MVPs, if one guy is falling behind, it doesn't mean that you're not a good team. It just doesn't mean you're as good as your opponent. Um, the good thing for Kyrie Irving, he did not have a good games one and two last year either uh, in the Bay when the Cavs fell down 0-2. Cavs came back to the queue for game three. Kyrie scored 30, and the Cavs won by 30. So perhaps he can enter himself back on that MVP echelon uh, with a strong game tonight or tomorrow night. Two to one is so much easier to keep track of in terms of a scoreboard that's impacting the actual scoreboard in these games, Dave. Let's get to Tristan Thompson, who hasn't had much of an impact at all, really, on this series so far. Nothing compared to a year ago. How much are the Cavs still depending on him in game three? Yeah, he described his game one performance as trash. He was better in game two, but still not the type of uh, effective player that we've seen him being able to switch out and pick and rolls and thwart uh, offensive players being able to seek, uh, you know, slip back on defense and hit the glass. It hasn't been there. The question will be if the Cavs feel like they need to generate offense. And, you know, of course, the Warriors scored 113 in game one and 132 in game two. Will we see more Channing Frye? Uh, Teron Lue went early to Channing Frye in game three, but didn't really go back to him until the game was out of hand. Uh, they need some scoring somehow. and They only shot eight for 29 from three as a team in game two. Perhaps Channing Frye could be one of the guys to get more run if they go away from Tristan Thompson just to get some offense because the Warriors are a juggernaut on that end. All right, game three coming your way tomorrow night. We'll see whatever strategy it is. It's 9 p.m. Eastern on ABC. That's Dave McMenamin with the insight.